Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to episode five of Redman and Riddle, our little podcast. Yeah. We're quite pleased that we got to episode five. You know, I thought we were going to run out of things to say <laughs> after about number two. But here we are. We're here still we are. going. We are. You might be wondering, why did you call it Redman and Riddle? I think mainly we like alliteration and we couldn't think of anything right. clever to say. It's because you worship got a wise. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's really the truth of it. But what I love it, I love it because it's really two mates, two friends that's right. talking that's right. about worship as if we were just sitting in the coffee shop because that's how this whole thing started. Just some conversations, realizing we're on the same page hmm. on so many things, realizing we're able to sharpen each other through conversation and thinking why don't we record some of this so this is where we are redman and riddle <laughs> still trapped in a room somewhere <laughs> talking about worship uh, and so we haven't got it all right we're just learners along the way but we do want this conversation to happen that's right for me that's the main thing isn't yeah. it we like like you've said several times this isn't it a takedown this is just about generating conversation yeah. let's m make sure we're at least asking some questions yes. talking about some things and running things through the filter of the kingdom of God. Come is on. this looking how it's meant to look? Come on. So that's what we're doing today. I hope you've enjoyed the ones so far, and I hope they have sharpened you in some way. Today, we're going to be looking at a big theme, imminence versus transcendence. Now, don't ask me to spell those words, <laughs> but I do roughly know what they mean. So imminence, we're talking about the fact that God gets very up close and personal in your lives, gets, gets very involved in your life. And then the transcendence of God, the fact that he's completely otherly, completely off the charts of anything we can imagine. And when those things come together, something really special happens. It's true. I, I've been fascinated, actually, with, with that theme right from the beginning, uh, way, way back before a lot of people will even be born when you were listening. <laughs> when I wrote, I wrote a song called The Friendship and the Fear, and it yeah. became an album title. Yeah. And for me, I don't think I've ever strayed from that theme, that fascination of what happens when you mix friendship with fear? How wow. can it be that one who's so completely, utterly holy right. and righteous and radiant <laughs> and pure <laughs> and powerful, how can it be he wants anything to do with us? Yeah. And how can, how can it be that he even paid a price wow. that he, he, we might even be called the friends of God? Wow. I love that. In, in, when Jesus says to his disciples, I've called you friends. And he qualifies that by saying, because a, a, a servant does not know his master's business. Wow. He, he's saying it's about how much I reveal to you. You're getting yeah. so much revealed to you now of the deep and secret things of God wow. that you're a friend of God. Wow. And I, I love that. And, and so I've always found that a fascinating subject. And it's a big one, though. Someone once said that trying to describe and convey God's like trying to pour the ocean into a teacup. Huh. But that's what we're doing today. We've got about <laughs> 40 minutes or something. And it, that, that's our little teacup. And we're trying to talk about these grand themes. Uh, so here, here's, uh, Jeremy, here's a, here's a quote that got a lot of this going for me. Two guys called Olsen and Grintz, they're these scholars, and they noticed that often streams of the church or even different time periods of the church, we swing between the transcendence of God and the imminence of God. Wow. So you'll get one time where we're swinging real far into the imminent thing, but we've forgotten a little of the transcendence. Yeah. Other times where the complete opposite's happening. We've gone so far into wow. the transcendence of God that we're neglecting to think about what Jesus showed us about the imminence of God and how we could know God in that way. And they, and they said this, Olsen and Grant said in their book, 20th Century Theology. By the way, I couldn't understand most of that book. <laughs> so the quote you're about to hear is one of the only things I did understand. <laughs> did These guys that. are deep. But they said this, God is imminent within human experience as the transcendent mystery that cannot be comprehended in spite of his absolute nearness. Wow. I'll say it again and then unpack it. God is imminent within human experience as the transcendent mystery that cannot be comprehended in spite of its absolute nearness. What they're saying is, if you say you're drawing near to God, and then when you get there, all you find is a tame, domesticated, ordinary God, right. you're not as close as you'd like to think. <laughs> That's very true. Because actually, when you draw near to God, yes, yes, your sense of his mercy and his goodness and his kindness will increase, but at the same time, you'll see more of his holiness, more yeah. of his greatness, more of the grandeur and awesome qualities of who God is. Wow. That's what happens when we, when we truly draw near to God. And I think it's fair to say that sometimes that pendulum swings, right? It did, yes. Yeah, it does. It does swing. I was actually going to ask you, because I can testify that like in your life, this has been one of the most consistent things that you have 
champion that you have challenged, you know, the church in. I remember like one of my first real introductions to to you, besides the few little run-ins that we had, <laughs> was this little gathering that you had for vineyard worship leaders. And obviously the vineyard movement, for those of you who are old enough to remember, it was this it was this movement of worship that championed intimacy. Like, yeah. And it was known for its intimate worship. And yeah. honestly, it was really profound. And I don't honestly think it was speaking so much to to the the content of the song so much as as, as the style and the sense of his nearness that 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 the songs carried. And so they just they dubbed it kind of intimate worship. But but you kind of came in with with a corrective word you may not have <laughs> uh, known okay. that it was a sounds kind word. of arrogant <laughs> <laughs> but no, it, it, no. I, I think it was challenging but but you basically said hey and you did it in the most beautifully British way, where, where you, <laughs> you're, you're I pose kinda, it as a question, yes, probably. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like, yeah. Yeah, perhaps have we maybe taken this a little too far? Have have we have we have we, have we pushed into have have we taken intimacy and turned it into familiarity? You know, have have we lost something of the reverence of God here? And you, it was. I honestly think it was it was a prophetic thing that you were doing, like like, and not not in a not in a bad way. Something of like, hey, we have to hold these intentions. When we hold this intention, because really, what we're talking about when we talk about the imminence versus the transcendence of God, what we're talking about is really the heart of worship, because. It's only when you hold these two things in tension, when you truly hold them in tension, that the true, like, undoing wonder and awe of worship is really felt. It's, it's yeah. only, it, it's where our brains start to explode and only our hearts and our spirits know how to, how to respond. Like, it, it, it's beyond, it's, it's like we don't understand how a God as magnificent as he is, comes, like even just the incarnation, like that yeah. is, that's where our minds just begin to explode. Like not only did you come in human flesh, you came as a baby, <laughs> you, you, were, you were born into the world, you, and everything, the intentionality of that, the fact that, 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 you know, it's like that song back in the day, in the 90s, what if God was one of us? Yeah, I remember and, and I'm like, he was, yeah. <laughs> he, he became one of us. And that that's that that's that that's that thing that just blows our minds. So when we hold these things in tension, we like the true beauty of worship, wonder. Wonder is actually what happens. And when we lose these things, wonder is the thing. Awe and wonder is is is, is what's lost. And yeah, and I think what happens is, like you say, if you, if you don't paint that great big picture of who God is yeah. and His holiness and magnificence, then the intimacy isn't as special anyway. Yes. It's only special, Precisely. it's much more special when we first of all give the context. That, that's and exactly, the context yeah. is, yeah, this isn't just anybody you're getting to meet with. No. This is the king of kings. No. This is the creator of the universe. Yes. This is the high and holy God to whom the angels sing, holy, 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 you know, night and day. This is, that's who wow. we're getting to draw wow. near to now. And I think sometimes you could almost say, if you really value intimacy, then you have to value the the reverence because you're otherwise you're cheapening the empty. That, that's, that's exactly and, it. And it's, I mean, there's so many lovely pictures of this in scripture. In Matthew 28, you've got this great thing. Eugene, the late Eugene Peterson talked about this moment of what he calls resurrection worship because you've got this Mary's kneeling, mm -hmm. which is reverence. She's holding the feet of Jesus, which is the proximity and closeness mm -hmm. element of it. Peterson says that, on its own, bowing the feet of Jesus isn't resurrection worship. And in the same way, holding the feet of Jesus in closeness is not in and of itself an act of resurrection worship, wow. but it's the two together. Wow. He says the acts of reverence and intimacy need each other. Wow. The reverence needs the infusion of intimacy, lest it become a cool and detached aesthetic. And the intimacy needs to be suffused in reverence, lest it become a gush gushy emotion. <laughs> and I haven't heard it put better. Uh, like they need emotion. each other. That with, yeah. Without the reverence, the intimacy is this shallow, gushy right. emotion. Right. But without the intimacy, the 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 reverence is just this cool, detached aesthetic. That's right. And and I love seeing those two things come together. You see it in Revelation chapter one as well. You've got this amazing picture of Jesus holding the seven stars in his right hand in verse sixteen there, and then and then in verse seventeen he takes that right hand, he places it on John. He says, "Do not be afraid." Exactly the same thing. This amazing encounter with God, which is full of knowing the holiness of the one whose eyes are blazing like fire, yeah. 
and his face is shining bright in the sun. But but he's touching John. He's right. he's comforting him. He's drawing near, and it and it's an amazing thing when you see those things come together in worship. We we've all known that moment, that encounter where you think we're in the presence of a holy God here. Yeah, Tosa said. Because you can't go a whole episode without Tozer, okay? No, no. Yeah. We've, agree- we've agreed upon that. We haven't really. I'm forcing it on you. The greatness of God arouses fear within us, but the goodness of God encourages us not to be afraid of him. It's wild. To fear and not to be afraid, that is the paradox of our faith. I love that. Wow. To fear and not be afraid. I, I mean, I, I'm in awe of you, God. I know the fear of the Lord. Yeah. I don't have to be afraid of you. You you even said I could come with boldness and confidence yes. to draw near to you. Yes. And you're going to draw near to me. I mean, that's that's an amazing thing. If you think about the mm. pictures in the Old Testament where the journey towards God's mm. presence was so staggered and so limited yeah. and, and so cut off from many. Yes. And then here in the New Testament, it's like you can pretty much run in, yes. covered by the blood of wow. Jesus. And you can wow. you can come with boldness. You can come with a confidence, uh, yeah. absolutely beautiful. Come on. I think the thing that I never want us to lose, and, and this is the thing that we kind of lose one way or the other, is I, I think intimacy, I, I think we have to know that God's heart is to be a God in the midst of us. Yeah. Like, he, 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 he's not looking for distance. Um, and, and sometimes I, I think when, I, when I've seen how these two things, like the reverence stream, so, so to speak, or the intimacy stream, in one you have like this disconnect and, you know, like this distance, like it's almost like, and then, and then the other stream you have almost this like over familiarity to, to the point where it's like, are, are we really worshiping the Lord? And I, I think the tension is, is so important, but I, I think that I've seen the errors kind of like in, 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 in both, both camps. Yes. Because you know, there's that there's that little song that may we never lose the wonder, like you know, may we never. And I've just been thinking about like how do you hold on to to the wonder? And I I think you hold on to the wonder by holding these these two things really in tension. But you have to intimacy or drawing near to God, whatever you want to call it. You don't have to call it intimacy, but we've been invited close. And yeah. I think the body of Christ, like we need to know that we've been invited close when we come to. The Lord, we, we, we're, it says, draw near to the Lord and he will draw near to you. And when I look at the pinnacle of human relationships, when I look at the design of God, everything is moving towards, towards real, true intimacy, connection, deep, deep relationship. He's a relational God. He doesn't desire to keep us way at a distance. Like he's going to set up his, his city. He's going to be at the midst of us. It's Emmanuel. It's God with us. And he's invited us into this encounter. And I actually think that sometimes when we think that we're better off standing way back, like to, to be in reverence, it's actually you don't really experience the wonder and majesty of a king mm. who's in a distant land that you only hear about. Yeah. Like, and a lot of the church is kind of like we've heard of the greatness of God. We're, we're you know, we know he's, he's out there and he's above us. And it, it's, it's not, you don't really touch wonder until you come into his courts, like until you come into the, yeah. the splendor of who he is. It's only there that you're actually filled with awe and wonder. And, and it's like an intimacy. Intimacy isn't real unless, unless you're, you're like, it's the fullness of that, of that encounter, you know, with, with the Lord. And so I don't know, but I, I just, I've watched, it's like, and maybe you could speak into this, Matt, because I know you've carried this for so long, but how do you actually maintain reverence without that coolness, without that coldness? And how do you maintain intimacy without that familiarity? And how would you help or, you know, speak to worship leaders who are trying to navigate that tension? What are the keys that have kind of kept that fresh in your heart? I mean, I think it starts in scripture, hmm. you know, so you go back. I think sometimes the way I caught myself reading scripture early on was like, Old Testament, he's a bit unfriendly, isn't he? You know, <laughs> this God is like, I mean, he's, you know, he he's high and holy and there's some scary elements That's and there's true. a lot of very severe moments. Yeah. And what I used to think is like, and now we're in the New Testament and now, you know, he he's a bit more chill, yeah. you know? <laughs> <laughs> and I realized I was reading it wrong. Right. That A guy called William Barclay said... The, the New Testament is never in the slightest danger of sentimentalizing the idea of God. Mm-hmm. And that is exactly it for me. Let, I've got to reprogram my thinking a bit. He's wow. just as holy as he ever was. Wow. And 
You can see it all over the New Testament. You've got Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Yeah. I don't know how often I do that. That's a challenge wow. to me. Wow. I work it out a lot with like, oh, thank you for your grace today. Yeah. And that's a huge part of it, obviously. Right. But it's both. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29, for our God is a consuming fire. Yeah. I mean, wait a minute. You mean the Old Testament God, right? Right. No, that's in the New Testament. Mm. Our God is a consuming fire. Another example, Ananias and Sapphira mm. in the book of Acts. Yeah. Getting struck down dead yeah. for hypocrisy and lies. And yeah. I mean, that feels like, oh, wait, you've put this in the wrong book. That right. was meant to be in the Old <laughs> Testament. <laughs> no, this is in the New Testament. And yeah, it, no. amazing sense of the Holy Spirit's work there in this, yes. in this new church. And yeah. part of the Holy Spirit's presence meant there was going to be a severity yeah. towards sin. No, can, can you imagine like the the week after the service after oh Ananias and Sapphira? Like what kind of worship? <laughs> yeah, oh my like, if you were leading worship that next Sunday, there might have been some fear and trembling. Like so I'm like, oh Lord. No, I mean, if you really think about it, if you were in the room where you saw that go down. Yeah. Like, and, and you're seeing the power of God. You're seeing the yeah. activity of God. Like it changes. It oh, changes. and what's amazing, it's exactly the same thing. So because holiness is abounding, what also abounding is a grace. Wow. So that the they'll be appreciating the grace just as much as the holiness, right? In that moment, they'll be like, uh, whoa, it. you know, you're that holy. It's and and this it. kind of thing happens. And yet you said we could do this. Uh, no. Jürgen Moltmann, he said, it's only in relation to the wrath of God that we know the mercy of God. Wow. And that's exactly it, isn't it? Wow, it's like, let's say that again. It's only, in the, it's only in relation to the wrath of God that we know the mercy of God. Wow. And it's just... That was a moment, I'm sure, of, of realizing, says somewhere else in Scripture, consider the kindness and sternness of God, somewhere yes. else in the New Testament. Consider the kindness and the sternness. And I want to I make sure I'm doing both. So I think for me, in answer to the question, it definitely starts in Scripture, like yes. trying to get an understanding of, yes. right, who is it here that we're worshiping and, and yeah. how we, are we meant to approach? And when you get in it long enough, you start realizing they're both in here. Yes. They're, they're, yes, the fear of the Lord's in here, but very much so the, the friendship of the Lord's in play Ooh. too. And I think we have a challenge in our day because especially to convey and depict and capture something of the reverence side because we're not in a culture that appreciates reverence. It's true. In fact, our culture is going in the opposite direction That's towards right, irreverence. Yep downgrading what we think about people in authority right. positions e even in terms like of centuries ago our concept of royalty would yeah. have maybe been a little bit different totally so we're in this society where so much is going in the opposite direction and so it becomes a really important challenge to try and get to grips with some of those themes and and in some ways you know, in the old testament you'd be approaching the temple the tabernacle and everything about that journey was telling you god is holy the way it was laid out, the yes. furnishings, the colors, All of it. the every little ornate detail. Plus, and the, it, you do anything slightly amiss, you die. Yeah, you know, that, that, that really that, helped increase the reverence too. That's <laughs> a huge, that's a huge clue, isn't it? <laughs> along the way too, and then and then, um, yeah, it's like the high priest having to have a rope tied right. around his foot when yeah. he goes into the holy of holies <laughs> in case he's not going to really, come out alive. I mean, come on. Yeah. That exactly. makes you appreciate what we've got here. It's so true. He, he's he's not he's he's saying get rid of the rope and you can even come with boldness and confidence. Yes. I mean, come wow. on. But yeah, absolutely. And then in, in maybe a few centuries ago, you've got these cathedrals that we were building, and everything about that place told right. you some similar things. Right. It's like you feel small in that place. It makes you look up, and that organ music starts playing, which is. Some similar chords to like horror film music, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's pretty full on. And, Very full on. But it was all telling you one thing. He's majestic. Yeah. He's holy. Don't come lightly. Don't take this lightly. You know, don't tread here without realizing who it is you're approaching. You know, I love in the Old Testament, I wrote a song about it once. You know, God, God is in heaven, you're on the earth, so let your words be few. Yeah. And, and it's just like, calm with with that fear and trembling and so the big challenge for us in these days is we we don't have some of that in the mix culturally or or in terms of how we approach yeah. um what we're doing and so we have to fight for that stuff yeah and it could be in our song choice it could be it could be in the the way we pray and the things we say 
it could be overlap with like our episode one of like yeah. s- let's stop performing because that yeah. doesn't really give a clue to what's going on here yeah this is the people of god in the presence of god this yes. is no moment to be trying to show off in songs this is he's high and holy that nonsense doesn't carry here wow and so i think it's and the way we live off stage as well no it's true we'll be telling the people by the way they see you carry yourself when you're walking up there and when you're off and the way you're yeah. living life off that stage all of that as a worship leader is Firstly, you're offering to God, but secondly, you're, you're leading people and showing them we worship a holy God. Yeah. So I'm not going to let my eyes watch this kind of stuff. I'm not going to let right. my ears hear, hear right. this stone stuff. That's right. We, we've been called to be different. That's right. And I feel like one of the things I just is I think we need to understand that the atmosphere that we carry inside of us is so much more potent than we actually realize. And I, I, I think as worship, leaders when we talk about how to lead a room or how to connect with a room. And the thing that that's so underlooked is we always look at, at, at kind of like the externals and, and we kind of overlook the internals. We overlook the internal atmosphere that we carry. And everyone knows this from experience. Like if someone's stormy on the inside, they have an atmosphere. When they come into a room, we immediately feel it. Yes. Like, and we know, hey, something's not right there. You ever seen a couple that's in a fight? They don't, they're not fighting, right, but you know <laughs> something yeah. is not, not right. We have like an internal atmosphere that leaks. And, and I feel one of the most powerful ways that I have come to understand this is when I get around people who really genuinely fear the Lord, like there's a tremble inside of them. And when they open their mouth, when they begin to speak, it leaks into the room. And all of a sudden it's like, and the other thing is that we, we, uh, we, we really don't pay enough attention to is the power of the Holy Spirit flowing. Like when you cultivate that sense, when you begin to honor the Lord, there's something else that begins to come into the room. And that thing, that presence, the presence of the Lord, it has holiness in it. It has. And and I, I, I think it's, man, it's really, really important also to be around people, to feed on people who carry that. And I, I mean, I'll just tell you, you know, one of the, this friend, this pastor of mine, I've never been around someone who has so reminded me of the fear of the Lord, who has so reminded me of the holiness of God. We've had staff meetings where I've been in the room and, and I've had that Isaiah 6 the moment like, wow. where I've been like, whoa, woe is me. Yeah. Like, where, I love where, that. Where, it's not just a business meeting. I felt, no, it was not a business meeting. And I, I felt great. I felt like I was doing great. If I could, I would have led a worship service with total confidence. And I left that meeting going, oh, Lord. Like seeing, like I am a man of unclean lips. Like I am a man of unclean actions. Like I, like, and it was just like right there in front of me. And I knew in that moment, like, oh, I've, like this too is the presence of the Lord. And sometimes yeah. guys, we, we resist the Holy Spirit. We, we can resist him because it doesn't, it can feel deeply uncomfortable. Yeah. And don't think that nearness always means like, no. like this, this beautiful, warm, fuzzy experience. I love those experiences. Don't, don't get me wrong. I'll take them over the other ones, to be honest. But there are moments where, where the intimacy of the Lord, the nearness of the Lord has pierced my heart and exposed my sin and, and made it like that. I wasn't even aware of it. And it was like, oh, and, and, and so it's like, gosh, I don't even know where I was going with that. I think it it, it was, (laughs) it's coming back around full circle. But, but for me, it's like when we cultivate what we cultivate, inside of ourselves because guys we're, we're we're working against like everything that you talked about with cathedrals yeah we have the opposite problem we've got elevated stages platforms yeah. lights you know like everything pointing to the greatness of us honestly yeah like and and i and i think like the thing that i've watched trump all of those things that are really working against they're exalting humanity instead of the lord but but one person who truly carries a reverence for the Lord, who it says, as, as Isaiah says, who trembles at his work, yeah. that leaks into a congregation. Absolutely. And you mentioned there what sounds like repentance. And, and for me, that's one of the missing ingredients right now. I grew up in the Anglican church and we, we followed a lot of liturgical right. written pieces and we would say them together week in, week out. And I'm not saying I appreciated them every week. There's some weeks I was like, oh, you know. (laughs) But I look back and I treasure that because I think, oh, man, isn't that clever? Because it meant that every single week there were certain ingredients. That's right. No matter what songs were chosen, they were always in the mix. And for me, one of them was repentance. Yeah. We would always have a moment of repentance. Lord, we we don't come to um, this place this table trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We do not presume to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same God whose nature is always to have mercy. And it it was this moment of 
recognizing the holiness of God, yeah. repenting in the light of that, yes. and then receiving the mercy of God. Full on. And so even it didn't matter what the song choice was because huh. that was already in the mix. Yes. And so I look back and I think, man, huh. we could do with a bit of that. When's the last time we sung a song about repentance in our church? And I'm True. thinking, I mean, we've had a couple, but there's not many. That's, no. not, that's no. not often in the mix, but it was in the mix every single week wow. in my church. Wow. And so it's a recognition every single week of the holiness of God. Wow. And it's so important, <laughs> isn't it, to think about, okay, we may not have this, what we call liturgy, but we've all got our liturgies. Right. The way you do your service the way you approach it, the, you know, you've got your way of doing it right. and that is your liturgy and you have to make sure that your, liturgy, that your liturgy is making clear what the main and plain things are in this thing. So good. Uh, and, and it's leading you, we were always on a journey really sure. to, in fact, in, if you think about it, the repentance should become before the drawing near to God. Yeah. Let's get ourselves right. Yeah. Let's recognize who it is we're coming before and let's recognize the shortcomings we had hmm. and just get ourselves right with God before we draw near. Come on. And, and so that's really important to me. Um, C.S. Lewis, he had some interesting thoughts on what kind of language we use when we talk about faith. And I think these might be helpful here. He, he said that when we talk about faith, there's these three categories of language we use, the ordinary, the poetic, and the theological. Hmm. It's quite a helpful thought for songwriters, actually. I often hmm. think about this when I'm writing a song. Is it... Am I leaning too heavy into any of those? Is there any of those that I'm not really leaning into at all? Like this song just sounds like an essay because there's no poetry in it. <laughs> I love a Bono quote. He said, you can have a thousand ideas, but without emotion, it's just an essay. Wow. And sometimes the song sounds like an essay. That might be a weakness of some of the old hymns. As much as I True. love them, True. The, the weakness can be sometimes, it's just like a lesson about God. Yeah. But I want to go further than that. I want yeah. to be able to give my response to him. And yeah. even further than that, I'd like to be able to encounter him. And so, wow. you know, you can lean into that. Or the theological language, if you lean too heavy into that, then it sounds like, I don't know, scientific experiment. with All, all, these, all these little words that you don't really know what they mean. <laughs> you know, I used one earlier. I said the, the manifold. You know, f that's like a part of a car for most people. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but so... So the, there is the kind of language in there. And then the it's ordinary, true. the ordinary language, mm. that's probably where we hang out the most. Yeah. You know, and of course the problem is the the strength of that is that you can make God accessible and approachable and relevant. The downside is that if you're only ever living in the ordinary language, then he just sounds ordinary. That's right. Instead of extraordinary. Wow. They once said about Bruce Springsteen that his gift with the songwriting was he would take someone's ordinary life and make them sound extraordinary. Wow. And in the church, we've often we done the, the same. We've done the opposite, yeah. 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 <laughs> Take the extraordinary God and <laughs> suddenly he just sounds so ordinary. Um, Seriously. Though. Uh, so that's one thing to think about in, in this, when we're talking about imminence and transcendence. Mm. Think about those three types of language, ordinary, the poetic, mm. the theological. Are you using them? Is mm. there a good balance between them? Yeah. I think that's a helpful one. That's so good. I love the intentionality because this is something you have to actually put intention to like you have to work like i i think unless you have like a paul on the road to damascus kind of moment where where you are knocked off your high horse and you are met by a blinding light and you hear the voice of the lord like like and again i hunger for those kinds of experiences and i've had not anything close to to that but but i've had these powerful encounters with the lord that have reminded me of that, but this is also something that I have to feed, and it's kind yeah. of that thing I love. the 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 thing about the Book of Common Prayer is that it it basically takes you through. It's a disciplined reading to make sure that that it's like your 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 view of God is as holistic and yeah. and manifold. Yeah, <laughs> very, good, mate. very good, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew you'd know what it meant. <laughs> but it is. It, it, it's like there is a manifold wisdom uh, of the Lord, and and you have to. It's like that kind of intentionality. And sometimes when we just feed on what our hearts kind of naturally crave or move towards, we, we miss so many parts that really do provoke the, the wonder of God. And, and honestly, I, I would say if you guys don't read from people in the 1800s, <laughs> you, you, you probably won't get a, a lot of this. There is a real understanding that they had. And I really try and yeah. read from people who don't who weren't Christians in in my day and age yeah. because they're the 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 humanism 
the power of human is that like the, like the, 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 the more grandiose man has become in his own eyes, it's really hard to touch yeah. the reverence of the Lord. And we don't realize how much of that stuff has leaked into church culture, has become a part of church culture. Yeah. Until you begin to read in the 1800s where they were really combating that, where there was like a real reverence and respect, not just for God's authority, but for man's authority as well. And you read that, you read that tone, and that tone, again, catches, you know, inside yeah. of you. There's something in your spirit that testifies. I, uh, I so agree with you. Like, it's sometimes you have to wade through some language. Sure. But the gold is it. There's so much gold. There's so much treasure, treasure. in those books. I remember a guy, Francois Fenelon. He was huh. one of the a spiritual advisors to one of the King Louis of France, like, hundreds of years wow. ago. And he had this gem in there. He said, make yourself little in the depths of your heart. And I remember reading that and thinking, oh, wow, that's everything I want to do. Wow. But it's amazing to me that it's coming from someone written hundreds of years ago right. who was advising one of the kings of France about spirituality. And, that, and none of those books. Can like, you imagine in a Fran- if that was an advice given to kings of our day? Yeah, amazing. Make yourself little in the amazing. depths of your heart. What kind of government would flow? Oh, oh I love that. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah. But, it, but it's, there's none of those books like Francois Fenelon or any of those people, hmm. they never sound like a self-help book, do they? <laughs> like it's a whole other tone. <laughs> it's a whole other tone. And some of it's harsh and yeah. some of it's heavy. Right. And I find myself having to, there's certain authors Right. Uh, Oswald Chambers might be one. I can't sure. do him every day. Right. If, I, if, if I'm reading Oswald <laughs> Chambers every day, I, I, after day four, I feel like I'm the <laughs> most miserable, worst human being that ever lived. It's and, true. Uh, it gets counterproductive. Yeah. After a little so bit, I, yes. I need a little mix. But also yeah. the old hymn books, that's another place to go. Uh, I mean, I, I said earlier that maybe some, some of the weaknesses, some of these hymns can become like an essay. Right. But the strength is some of the poetic richness and some of the areas of revelation they dive into the are so all-encompassing celebrate amazing you know? you're amazing. like oh my goodness gracious and their language for it. every time i i, I start to there it's such a humbling thing to read through i literally have made it a discipline in my yeah. life to read the hymns yeah because for one i'm always hungry for language because yeah i think we're always looking as songwriters for for that for fresh language for you know and i don't know how many i that's been a huge piece of inspiration for me just to read hymn books. It also just reminds you that whenever you think you've hit it, as far as there's, we've said everything there is to be said about God, then you start reading the hymns and you're like, oh, wow, we haven't even yeah, amazing. the and surface. Some of the kind of poetic angles they're coming from. Yeah. And those hymns, um, just like the Fenelon and all those guys, their books never sound like a self-help book. That's right. The hymns never sound like a me and Jesus here and now song. That's right. You know, that you can pretty much guarantee it's going to go wider than that. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with a me and Jesus here and now song. Totally. I, I'm totally into that kind totally. of song. But if that's all I'm singing or all I'm writing, right. there's definitely a problem. Right. I heard it described like this one time that some of the best songs, they, they, they bring in this timeline to blow, blow everything open. Yeah. So they, they have... They tell you about the God who was and the God who is and the God who is to come. Yes. So they don't just tell you about the, the God of today. They tell you about the God of yesterday, yes. the God of today, and the God of forever. Right. Graham Kendrick, he showed me one time. He's like, look, verse one is, is reenactment. You tell the old, old story of what happened. You tell something about the story of God. Make sure that our scope's bigger than just here today, like me and my experience with Jesus here today. Then, then the second phase is, is the realization. So you go from reenactment, telling the story, to realization. What does that story mean wow. to me here wow. today? And, and, then, and then you go from there to the anticipation. Hmm. So it's, this isn't even in the end of the story, guys. This, there's more. <laughs> yeah, there's more. So we've got reenactment, realization, anticipation. Wow. All you're basically doing is worship, worshiping the God who was and is, and is to come. The, you're the God of yesterday, today, and forever. Profound. And, and Immediately, what you've done is you've 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 opened up the landscape. That's right. This is a whole different thing we're involved with now, yes. and and the me and Jesus part of it's going to be even more powerful, right? Because it's like whoa, I'm part of this right. epic love story with God, right? And I I love that approach, and it doesn't have to be complicated. Wow. One of my approaches, when you get into a, something like themes of reverence, we all automatically think, oh, it's got to be complicated now. You know, this is, no. oh man, this is going to get complicated. No, it doesn't have to be. Simple, a song can be simple without being shallow. That's right. And I think some of my favorite songs have done that. But the whole old song, There is a Redeemer, Yeah. Uh, Melody Green, verse one, There is a Redeemer, Jesus, God's own son. It's telling the old, old story, reenactment. Wow. 
Verse 2, Jesus, my redeemer. So now it's the realization, oh, wait a minute, that's got relevance to my life. Wow. He, that savior, he, he's my savior. Wow. The God of today, right here today. And then stage three, anticipation, when I stand in glory, mm -hmm. I will see his face. So you look at that song, that's not a complicated song. No. But it's in no way shallow. Right. It's a simplicity to it, wow, but it's man. taking you into the story of God. And, and I'm all for that. You, you clearly are all for that. You, you've literally done that. You've written those kinds of songs. I think for people, and maybe this is helpful, and we'll probably have to bring this to a close, but, but I, I feel like the most important thing, and maybe just speaking to songwriting, worship leading is, but I, I, think, I think it's fascinating because we, we not only get to be born again in God, you know, and of God, we, we get to grow up in God. Yeah. And, and, I, and I think... Which means that we go through stages. We we actually mature, you know, as, as as believers. But sometimes I think when we miss certain stages, the next stage that we try and walk in is actually hollow. Like it doesn't have any any, any real depth to it. Oh, and I think great. a lot of people, because there is something like like if if we were to compare a childhood to it, like a childhood in God, where where there is a stage where I think it's really important for writers just to learn to be honest just to learn to take their heart before the Lord. And if you try and jump into this mature stage where you're trying to write these hymns of generational things and, and you haven't even learned how to bring your own heart before yeah, the Lord, great. I, I think I think you actually won't ever be really successful. And I, I think I'm so grateful for some of the seasons, even as a writer, even actually they, they weren't my, my highly spiritual seasons. I, I think where I... I, I'm actually grateful for a season where I pulled the plug on the whole worship leading career track <laughs> and I tried to make it in mainstream music. The gift for me of that season was was I I I, I came out of the whole worship bubble and just trying to write a worship song. Yeah. And I just was like, what's happening inside of me? And I just learned to bring that out in language, whatever, whatever that was. That's great. And when I took that to worship, I learned something about honesty that there was no going back. And so even though I, I, I actually have only, once I, you know, 23 years old, I started writing worship songs again. And I've never stopped. I've never gone back to trying. But I learned something about that authenticity and that honesty in that season. And it was a bit like having a, a childhood with the Lord of just going, I had to, I had to find my heart. And then, and then, and then, once I found my heart in relationship to God, then it was like this this platform that ultimately grew grew larger and larger. And 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 then those songs, my my, it's like something about honoring that season led me to that season of actually being able to write true songs of reverence. Yeah, that weren't imitation, that that weren't Love even that. just conceptual. They actually were flowing from something genuine and real in my heart. And and so, if you're like on this journey, guys, as 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 a writer, there is something very powerful about about learning to honor where you're at, not, not skip a stage, but also know that the Lord is maturing you. He's growing you up. And these disciplines that you put in your life, these disciplines of intentionality will begin to bear fruit. And those songs, just like David learned how to worship as, as a shepherd, then learned how to worship in a cave, then learned how to worship as a king. He had encounters with the glory of God. That's like, you talk about the friendship and the fear, it's straight out. Yeah. It's like he was rejoicing and then he was, said he was afraid of God when he was bringing the ark back in and as one of his friends was struck dead. It's like, yes, yeah. you'd be afraid of God that day. But David had all these things and, and you watch the whole catalog of songs in his life. Anyway, I don't know what you all will feed on in there, I love but I that. know there's something there. That's really great. I love that. And it, and it's just that permission to let your heart overflow. Yes. So this isn't because because the danger would be after a conversation like this that we go and take up our guitar or piano and start writing and it's just a cerebral exercise. It's, exactly. It's just this but that's absolutely not what we're saying. We're that's saying exactly, yeah. it's almost you want a heart explosion that's guided by truth. Yes. And, Come on, Matt. And that that's what we're after. And that and that's so powerful, isn't it? When it we've is. seen those worship songs that clearly have a ton of heart in them and they've yes. got these they've got they contain something of the wonder of god yeah come on amazing well yeah. let's pray together today we've got our friend quinton here with us he's sitting patiently listening to all of this good good man <laughs> and a great keyboard player and, and come on. we just love to make sure that these podcasts aren't just that mind yeah. experience that yeah. cerebral thing <laughs> we love this to engage with your heart and and for you just to take some of what we've said today and think what well, does any of this connect with me today is there any of this that god is speaking to me through and i know even as we spoke today i, I was just so grateful again for 
just who God is in his holiness and, and his grace. That I mean, it is an amazing thing that we'll never stop being amazed by, that, that someone like him, so high and holy, would, would, would want to have that imminence in our lives, be up close and personal and very involved in our lives. It's just a beautiful mystery. So breathe it in again today. Just drink that in again today. We come to the cross of Christ today where Luther said, holiness and love kiss in the cross. Just think about that for a moment. He is, he's no less holy than he ever was. This is the holy God. And yet his, his son, bringing us uh, the, the most full expression of love we've ever seen. So just breathe that in today. I love this from John Piper as well. God meets us in high and holy ways. He meets us in lowly and meek ways. He meets us in thunderously glorious ways. He meets us in quiet, intimate ways. He meets us in complex ways and simple ways, furious ways and merciful ways. Thank you, Jesus, that we have the privilege of meeting with you, of drawing near, of knowing God and being known. I just want to pray um, like a prayer that will, 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 I want to pray that the Holy Spirit would reveal Jesus to us. And I want to pray that over you. But before I do, I just, I want you to quiet your heart and, um, and believe as you pray this, that the Lord will, the Holy Spirit delights to glorify the Son. He, he delights. And, and some of the, the ways that we're looking to see Jesus, only, only the Holy Spirit can unlock uh, many of the ways that we are longing to encounter the Lord. The Lord, only the Holy Spirit can unlock the fullness of revelation. Even the Word of God, we need the Holy Spirit to unlock for us. So I want to pray over you right now that the Holy Spirit so just posture yourself Holy Spirit I pray right now that you would reveal Jesus to your worshiping community those Levites those who have set themselves apart to be a people who glorify Jesus on this earth and to not only glorify you in and of themselves Lord but to lead your church your bride into the fullness of worship and the expression of heaven here on earth God I pray that right now that you would begin to reveal Jesus you would reveal Jesus to them the manifold wisdom and beauty and nature of Jesus. Lord, that we would see the Father, that we would see the Spirit, that we would see the Son, that we would get caught up. Lord, that you would teach us about Trinitarian worship. You would teach us what you, how you see each other, the fullness of beauty. Lord, the the, the adoration that is within your very relationship. God, I pray that you would pull us in. Holy Spirit, lead us into the worship that pleases you. Yeah. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, we pray you lead us into wonder. Hmm. Would you lead your church into wonder? Would you would you enable and inspire and equip worship leaders and songwriters, even those listening right now, to find those new songs and those new expressions and those new word patterns and lyrics? Yes that convey yes. just a little more of what it is we're involved with here and who yes. it is we're approaching. Holy Spirit, we can't do that on our own. Wow. I thank you for the gifts you place in this. I, I pray you fan them into flame in a yes, new way. Amen. And that your church would find ways to describe you, convey you, and yes. paint a big, glorious, life-changing picture of who you are. <laughs> wow. We pray all these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thanks, everyone, for checking in with us today. Thanks for for hanging in with us through this conversation. I hope you found it inspiring, and I hope it's going to lead to other conversations uh, with with those you love and with your worship teams. Not saying you don't love them, but you know what I'm saying. And, And with your 
maybe your pastor, whoever it is. You know, mm. the, we feel these are such important times and important themes to be talked about. Um, so let's keep this conversation going, and we'll see you on our next episode. God bless today. Hey, before we go, I wanted to just let you know how you could be part of this ongoing conversation too. Jeremy and I have decided to record some question and answer special episodes where we'll take some questions and comments from worship leaders and worshipers around the world and then let you guide the conversation. So if you'd like to try and contribute, then here's how. We've got a special phone number with a voicemail set up. So call 1-888-774-5679 which is 1-888-77-GLORY. That's 1-888-774-5679 or 1-888-77-GLORY. Leave Jeremy and myself a message and we'll see where it goes. We so look forward to hearing from you. But for now, thanks so much for listening in. And if this podcast series has been of benefit to you in any way, please do subscribe on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts from. And please do recommend it to other worship leaders, pastors, and worship teens and any just full-on worshippers who you think might like to take a listen. Finally, a big thanks to all who have helped us pull this together today. Thanks to Gold Pacific Studios in Orange County, California, where we recorded these, and to Quinton, our keyboard player, who's been in the room each time. And a big thanks to Sam Bailey for the theme music. A massive thanks to Jason Jones, Andrew Senga, and all of the Integrity Music family who've done so much to make these podcasts happen. God bless you today, wherever you are. We'll see you next time on the Redman and Riddle podcast. Thank you.